Hello, um, my name is Lewis Lee, and I'd like to get a copy of the uh, state constitution. How could I get a copy of that? Hold on just a moment. If you go to the Secretary of State's website, yes, you can download it. Let me give you that address. Okay. The thing is, I don't, I don't have internet access. I was, I was hoping that I could get like a copy of it to have at my house. Hold on just a minute. The Alabama deep sea fishing rodeo will be July fifteenth through the seventeenth in Dolphin Island. Attorney General. Hello. Uh, my name is Lewis Lee, and I'd like to get a copy of the Alabama State Constitution. One moment. The Attorney General's office. Hello, my name is Lewis Lee, and I'd like to get a copy of the Alabama State Constitution. You want a copy of it? Yes. For for educational purposes. Hold on. The Constitution for me leaves no sweet-smelling savor in my nostrils. We're all time stealing. There's very little that is democratic. This is a bizarre way to do business. Okay, I'm back. Okay. I'm not sure what I mean, because we don't issue them. I'm trying to see where you can get one from, what's on this book. Because it's a thick book. There's no way I can even copy this and give it to you. The Alabama Deep Sea Fishing Rodeo is the nation's largest saltwater fishing rodeo with more than 3,000 fishermen competing for large jackpots and prizes. For more information, see the calendar of events at 800 Alabama. Sexy State's office. This is Virginia. Uh, I would like to get a copy of the state constitution. Um, hold us to my one. Features children. Southerners have a proud history of recounting their entire history, even when it's not so proud. Through history books, historians, and newspapers, will view the circumstances that both ground today's debate and even more so tell a genuinely fascinating story. In the late 1800s, the Democratic Party dominated Alabama's politics. The Democrats' only opposition came from the small and mostly black Republican Party until the 1890s, when white and black small farmers started uniting under the Jeffersonian Democratic, or Populist Party. They believed the Democratic Party mainly represented corporations and large landowners. Historians called their challenge the Populist Revolt. What about the Populist Revolt? The Populist Revolt in the 1890s was very important, certainly in the history of Alabama politics. The Populist came close to winning the governorship a time or two in the 1890s, and actually they probably did win it if there had been an honest election, but the conservative Democrats were able to prevail again, mm. primarily by manipulating the African-American vote in their favor. Uh, there was an old saying down in the Black Belt, folks, we have democracy, vote, folks vote the way they want to, we count them the way we want to. The Black Belt refers to a fertile agricultural region of 12 counties across lower Alabama. Historically, the Black Belt was over 70% African American, but it was a stronghold for the conservative white Democrats who owned the region's large plantations. Uh, what they would do is that uh, people would vote and uh, they would not count the vote and they would count in instead votes that were not cast. Okay. Uh, in some cases, uh, people would not appear at the polls, but miraculously they would vote anyway. Uh, governor Jelks, before he became governor, at the State Democratic Executive Committee meeting in Montgomery in the eight, late 1890s, said, for God's sake, let's get some laws on the books uh, uh, disfranchising all blacks uh, because I'm tired of stealing. We're all tired of stealing votes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look good when we arrive at the pearly gates to tell Jesus that we were stealing uh, uh, votes. He literally said that. There was this strange 
double-mindedness here that first of all people in the black belt saw themselves as heroic and in fact other members of the democratic party saw the black belt as heroic because they were stealing these votes to keep the white democrats in power mm -hmm. but at the same time there was this sort of feeling that gee you know it's not really right to steal votes and so there was a lot of corruption in elections and there was a general feeling in alabama not by no by no means was it a unanimous feeling that we needed to have a constitutional reform we might say that would purify the election process by removing African Americans. Obviously in the 21st century it seems absurd to say we want to purify things by removing such a sizable segment of our population from the political process, but the Constitutional Convention of 1901 was called for the ignoble purpose of actually disfranchising African Americans. So what we're saying in effect is that we are going to take the right to vote away from people so that other people won't steal it. Okay. All right, you follow the logic? Right. Okay, good. This was all presented as a reform movement. Mm -hmm. We're going to get rid of unqualified voters. We're going to get rid of people whose vote can be bought and sold. We can get rid of people who can be manipulated. And we are going to purify the ballot. The Constitution Suffrage Article, which regulated voting, became the source of greatest controversy at the convention. Delegates struggled to determine who to disfranchise and how to go about it without violating the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting. But that was that was where all the debate was over. How do you, uh, you know, how do, how do you do away with the black vote, protect the white vote, or at least protect it long enough so we can get this thing ratified. Now, no matter what anybody says about the events that may have touched off the drive for the 1901 Constitutional Convention, it is not true that race was the sole driving factor behind this. <laughs> if you're going to use literacy tests, for example, well, a significant part of, of, the, uh, of the whites are illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to use property qualifications, well, Alabama was becoming increasingly a sharecropper agricultural system. People didn't have property. Even white people. Even white people. And if you're going to have a poll tax, well, poll tax is expensive. Well, the poll tax is just simply a tax saying that you had to pay a dollar and a half a year uh, if you wanted to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, a dollar and a half is a lot of money. Uh, to somebody in the 1890s, you could feed your family for a week on a dollar and a half. And so, you know, there were people who were really skeptical and saw this as not just something against black people, but also was an effort on the part of the conservative white establishment to beat back the power of the people who had been populist. Because many whites feared losing the right to vote, the 1901 Constitution met stiff opposition. Alabama historians claim that in order to pass the document, proponents likely used fraud in the votes, both to call the convention and later to ratify the new charter. Uh, in both cases, had it been a, a straight vote, had mm -hmm. there been no political shenanigans in the black belt, the convention probably would not have been called and probably the, the document would not have been ratified. The Constitution passed only by a narrow margin when it was put before the people for ratification in 1901 and the great majorities for the Constitution came in counties where African Americans were the most populous. Because in the Black Belt uh, all these black people turned out to vote for a constitutional convention that was called primarily to disfranchise blacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if you believe that, uh, soccer is born every day. And that's totally absurd to think that African Americans would freely go to the polls and say, yes, I want this constitution, which is going to deny me and my successors, my family members, my children, grandchildren, and on and on the right to vote. That doesn't that's not reasonable at all. That's why we feel like that even the Constitution itself was adopted by fraud. I mean, you can go through almost all of the black belt counties mm -hmm. and, and you know, it, it would seem as though that by some miracle 
uh, black people appeared and voted to do away with their own right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and overwhelmingly, you know, two or three thousand to three hundred or something like that. Uh, and you know, it, it just flies in the face of reason. Here's what the historians were talking about. Outside the Black Belt, the vote to ratify the Constitution was 76,000 to 72,000 against ratification. The Constitution passed because the Black Belt counties voted overwhelmingly for it, but their votes look suspicious. For example, Dallas, Hale, and Wilcox counties voted 18,000 to 500 for ratification, though the white voting population was only 5,600, seemingly to say over 12,000 black Alabamians in these three counties alone voted for the Constitution and helped establish white supremacy by law. What was a surprise was that most of the Negroes in North Marengo voted for the Constitutional Convention said that they wanted to be with the white people, their friends. Although the most important in 1901, the suffrage portions have been repealed or invalidated by federal courts. The state even dropped the poll tax for blind and deaf people, which would have helped Helen Keller if she weren't a woman. So, the suffrage article is largely irrelevant to the debate today, and most of the issue instead focuses on portions pertaining to taxes and local government. But, as you learn about taxation and local government issues, contemplate their roots in a convention of landowners and corporate lawyers protecting their interests. You can see the calendar of events at 800alabama.com. Sir, I'm going to transfer you to the department that can help you. Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, you did say you want a copy of the state constitution? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now this is the Department of Transportation. You'll probably have to call it. Home rule would be uh, through laws uh, granting local governments the uh, authority to make decisions without the uh, without having to go to the legislature. It's uh, making decisions closer to home. Florida outlawed uh, the raising of fighting roosters. You know, when that happened, a lot of the growers moved up over the state line into Alabama. Alabama's Constitution limits home rule in the first instance because it does not grant home rule authority. Mm. Let's say we want to enforce an ordinance against fighting roosters. First thing we have to do is bring it to the commission and vote on it in a commission meeting. And then we'll look, draw up an act, we'll submit it to, the, uh, to, a, to one of our legislators who will sponsor it. It then has to be advertised for four consecutive weeks in the local newspaper. Uh, so you've got a four week span there that you have to wait in addition to uh, very high costs that we have to pay uh, to have that bill advertised. Mm -hmm. After that time, then it has to go to the Alabama House, be introduced, go to local government committee, pass in the House, go to the Senate, go through the same procedure. Really? Uh, and then once that is done, is done, signed by the governor, and then it becomes law. Uh, I have to decide what it is that I think the people want me to do. I have to put that in, a, in words that I can explain to my legislative delegation. Every county has a group of senators and representatives that represents their county. Then the delegation puts it in the local uh, bills committee in Montgomery, which is not a committee anyway. It's a room with a computer in it that these bills are filed in. Oh, really? Every local delegate person must vote in favor of the local bill to come out of that committee. Which Generally speaking, if one member of a delegation is opposed to a local bill, it generally will not pass. So who, who all is in the delegation? In this county, there's two senators and four uh, state representatives that have parts of our county. So do any of those representatives not live in St. Clair County? Oh, sure. In fact, out of that group, only one of those people live in St. Clair County. Uh, we have one that 
that only represents citizens in Houston County. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously he lives in Houston County. All the others live outside of Houston County. <laughs>I was wondering if I could get a copy of the state constitution. The state constitution is an entire volume located as part of the code, Alabama Code of Alabama. Um, you know, I don't have one to give you a copy of. I mean, surely there's got to be something that exists where it's just that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like the basic law of the... Yeah, but um, as you probably know with Alabama, I mean, ours is one of the longest constitutions you know, yeah, all so 50 states, so. Actually, Alabama's constitution is the longest in America, with almost 800 amendments when this movie was created. Here's us stacked up against other long constitutions in terms of word length. And here's how we compare to all 50 states. More important than word length is the number of times the constitution has been amended. Here's us compared to the top 10 most amended and now, against all 50. Let's investigate. Here's a graph showing our Constitution's growth in amendments since 1901. As you can see, growth started out slow, but instead of growing constantly, growth started to accelerate, just like a falling object. Now, with calculus, you can find a function that tightly models the curve. What's cool about the function is that we can follow the curve and estimate the future length. By 2030, the curve predicts about 1,280 amendments, over 50% more than today. We'll pass our 1,000th amendment in just 10 years, the curve predicts. Daniel Chappie James trained the Tuskegee Airmen and flew combat missions in Korea and Vietnam. In 1975, he became the first African-American four-star general. Today, in Tuskegee, the Daniel Chappie James Aerospace Memorial commemorates him as a hero of Alabama history. In addition, Chappie left his mark in another way. Building the memorial required two constitutional amendments 437 and 438. Amendments like these, that only pertain to a single county or city, account for over 70% of the Constitution's length. There are 18 amendments concerning bingo games as charitable fundraisers in particular counties. Well, I came to Alabama in 1983 and I almost uh, from the start, my, one of the first times I voted, I realized I was voting on things that I didn't know anything about. And it was very strange to me. I'd lived in North Carolina, Kentucky, and Ohio in my adult life. And in neither of those states, in none of those states, had I ever voted on something for a particular county. And that was strange, and I had to find out why, and I thought, this is a bizarre way to do business. In all, about uh, 100 constitutional amendments, a little over that, pertain to nothing except the payment of a local official in a county, which of course should not be a statewide concern. I don't give a hoot what you pay somebody in Jefferson County who happens to be your judge. That's of no interest to me in Lee County, yet I have to vote on that. Uh, trustful cannot annex property in the boundaries of St. Clair County unless the citizens of St. Clair County vote on it. Trustful's efforts to annex had to be voted on by the entire state. Trustful voted yes. The citizens of Trustful voted yes. We wish to do you know what the margin was? Um, the I think they lost it about two to one. If you were 18 or older in 2004 and cared enough about your country to exercise the minimum responsibility of citizenship, this might look familiar. If not, this is the ballot for the last presidential election. Just like everywhere, the ballot includes a choice of presidents and various other officials pertaining to the voter. However, our ballots also possess a feature unique to Alabama, the ability to vote on local issues in counties you don't live in. Can you just describe what happened on election day in 2004? Well, it was my first time to vote and I knew I'd have some tough choices to make.
but there were some choices on the ballot I wasn't prepared for. I've been to Trustville once, but I'd never heard of Crenshaw County. And I actually thought that Macon County was the county in To Kill a Mockingbird. So I froze and I made some questionable decisions. That's actually how I became first acquainted with constitutional issues. It's absolutely not efficient. It's very inefficient the way it is now for some of the things that I just elaborated on. It could be made more efficient by opening the process up and empowering local governments to do to answer more of these questions. Now, we're, we're less efficient than even a good, inefficient representative's democracy right. can be as a result of our uh, structure. And so it's totally out of your hands and, and wastes a lot of time and, and taxpayer money, mm -hmm. which is important. Do you think that could save um, taxpayer money? It could save lots of money and it could save lots of time. For instance, the legislature right now dealing with two-thirds of its bills being local bills and they spend a whole session fighting over all kinds of issues and they use those local bills as leverage against one another. Alabama legislature only meets three months out of the year. So what happens when they're not in session? We wait. You have that's, to all, wait. that's all we you can, can do. You can wait up to nine months. We, can, we uh, have to sometimes. Sometimes we have to wait years. I mean, uh, it's not good. That's bad for the locality. I think it's bad for Montgomery. We probably spend 25, 30 percent of our time, maybe more in some years, dealing with local issues. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of time to spend in Montgomery that we ought to be spending on other issues, budgeting issues, statewide issues. Yeah, when the legislature meets, say they adjourn in April, and we have an issue that comes up in May it's all the way until the next February or March before we can actually do anything about addressing it. Uh, and then of course the localities get gummed up having to wait on something to get done in Montgomery or can't do something at all. There are times when we'll have an issue come up that we want to draw up local legislation and for whatever reason the legislation gets bogged down in the things that are going on in the legislature and it doesn't pass. Mm. Uh, in which case we come back again the next year, re-advertise, re-spend all that, all that money uh, and hopefully get it passed at that time, so. When you centralize the power at one level of government, mm -hmm. uh, you do give uh, the interest groups uh, an ability to work in one place. I mean, it's a lot easier to control 140 folks in Montgomery that are in session three or four months a year than it is to influence uh, several hundred municipalities in 67 counties. Local governments don't, uh, don't have a lot of innate power. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, interest groups can control the authority uh, of local governments because the only place they have to go is to the legislature. If you need a sales tax, uh, the delegation might say, well now before I'm going to vote for it, some senator or representative in your delegation says, before I'm going to vote to get it out of the local act, I want 20% uh, of this to go to the senior centers. Oh, really? And then another delegate will say, well you know, I kind of want 20% of it to go to the sheriff's department. So before you ever get it voted on, the delegation has decided how you spend it. The festival also features children's activities, a seafood cook-off, and a motorcycle and hot rod rally. For more information, see the calendar of events at 800alabama.com. Alabamians hate taxes. Our per capita state and local taxes were the lowest in America last year. Keep in mind, though, that the way we tax can be as or even more important than how much. The delegates to the 1901 convention constitutionally limited taxes, and as a legacy, our tax structure is embedded in the Constitution, with hundreds of amendments concerning taxes in single counties and cities.
Well, taxation is another matter, and it should not be embedded in the Constitution. Ours is almost completely in the Constitution, and we should have tax laws, but they're part of the state statutes and not necessarily part of the Constitution. The Constitution should say, here's how you do taxes, here's how you assess taxes, uh, and you ought to have the consent of the people who have to pay them. But other than that, the Constitution should not be the tax code for the state of Alabama. The Constitution has more detail on certain taxes than it does on others. Mm -hmm. In our case, uh, it has a great deal to say about property taxes and the income tax, and virtually nothing to say about the sales tax. Okay. There are three basic ways of taxing. We can tax people according to what they make, that's their income. We can tax them according to uh, the property they own, that's the property tax or the assets that they have. Or we can tax them according to the transactions and that's sales taxes. So income, sales, and property are the three basic big uh, sources of revenue. Our property taxes are extremely low in the state of Alabama. Most people come here can't believe it that our property taxes are so low. But on the other hand, we have sales tax on everything. Sales tax on food and sales tax on the items that are generally exempt in other states. And we have become, for funding at all levels of, of, of government, state and local, highly dependent on the sales tax. So what we want to seek is a balance among all three of the taxes. The, the term that's used in the, uh, in the field is you, you want um, a three-legged stool, income, sales, and property, and rough balance. Okay. And if you look at the national average, that's what you'll see, that on average, the states roughly balance those three sources. We just have a system that's much heavier on its use of the sales tax, very low on its use of the uh, property tax, and then just slightly below average on its use of the income tax. Okay. Sales tax is pretty hard hit in Alabama, and it has become the catch-all for funding local government and in particular education in Alabama. Here's how Alabama raises its tax revenues among property, income, sales, and other taxes. And here's how some of our more balanced neighbors raise taxes. So constitutional limits on income and property taxation have guided Alabama towards a sales tax based system. The sales tax is far from perfect though, and the property tax has its strengths. For the next segment, observe how a bias towards sales tax can create serious problems. To talk about Alabama's tax structure, we'll hear from Professor David Brunori of George Washington University, one of the foremost experts on state and local tax policy. Mr. Brunori, what are the principles of sound tax policy? One, adequacy. Your tax system has to raise enough money. So what you need is you need a system that is going to be stable over time. You can't have a system that, that is too tied to the ups and downs of the economy. Uh, proration is a situation that happens when revenue doesn't come in in adequate amounts to meet the actual budget for a given year. Let's say the economy suffers a downturn over the summer before that school year starts and the tax money comes in more slowly in smaller amounts than the legislature projected. Because of the heavy reliance for school financing of uh, uh, from Proper, I mean, from sales and income taxes, which are sensitive to the economy. Um, frequently, we get into a position where we budgeted more than actually comes in. And so you have to find a way, this school year, after you've already hired people and signed contracts with them and, and bought supplies and bought textbooks, somehow you've got to find a way to cut your spending by 11%. Uh, there have been times when, you know, uh, you called around to the other school and asked, you know, well, look, uh, do you have extra money I can borrow? 
I don't know when I'll be able to get it back to you. <laughs> you know, do you have any uh, extra tissue you can let me borrow? Principle number two is fairness. Everybody would agree, though, that no tax system in the country should be regressive. A regressive tax takes a greater share of income the less income you make, hitting the poor hardest. Do you think Alabama is significantly more regressive than other states? Alabama is among the most regressive of all states. I mentioned that there are three ways that we tax, income, sales, and property. Mm -hmm. All three of those taxes can, if they're pushed, have uh, fairness issues with them. But the uh, sales tax, by those who look at taxes, is considered the, mo the most regressive. To understand, think about a household's income for a year as a pie chart. First. All income is either saved or spent. Because saving is only affordable after covering necessities, as income rises, savings grows as a share of income. However, the sales tax only falls on spending. Second, all spending is on either goods or services. Goods are physical, such as food, medicine, and clothing. Services are tasks, such as legal work, home repair, and college tuition. As a rule, the wealthier you are, the more your spending favors services over goods. However, the sales tax only falls on goods. To break it down, a household with a $100,000 income spends proportionately less than a household with a $15,000 income. Next, out of what the wealthier household does spend, the lion's share is on services, while the less affluent household buys mainly goods. So, proportionately, the wealthier household spends less, and out of what they do spend, less is subject to the sales tax. Statistically, the $100,000 household pays sales tax on only about 25% of spending. The $15,000 household pays sales tax on close to 75%. If we want a situation where people have the opportunity to better themselves, then what you want to do is avoid taxing them where they can't do that, where they become dependent on the state. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can give people their own money to use and avoid overtaxing the people at the bottom of the scale, the better off they'll be in terms of, of uh, taking care of themselves. In 2002, the Institute for Tax and Economic Policy gauged how our taxes fall across household income groups. Alabama's flat rate income tax and property tax affect most families equally. However, sales and excise taxes draw a different picture. Excise taxes are specific sales taxes like the gas tax. You can see it's sales and excise taxes that make our whole structure harder on the poor. Since 2002, Alabama has dropped the income tax for families earning below $14,000. But overall, this is still who pays in Alabama. Uh, another principle that people talk about often is neutrality and this goes back to Adam Smith, tax system should distort the markets as little as possible. Neutrality means that a tax shouldn't change your economic choices. For example, this pie represents my spending for a year. Slice A is my spending on banjo lessons. Slice B is my spending on kites. And slice C is on massages. Now, I've divided my spending among these three hobbies and the proportions that are best for me. Now, the government enacts a tax to collect this much pie. A really good consumption tax should come in and slice the pie from around the edges. But a sales tax doesn't do this. With a sales tax, because the sales tax only falls on goods, it comes in and takes a big slice out of kites while leaving massages and banjo lessons untouched. It messes up my pie because the tax has actually altered my pie's proportions. So in a sense, the government has actually altered my behavior because kites are now more expensive relative to massages and banjo lessons. The sales tax is distortionary in another way too, but that way is even more boring to explain so we've saved it until after the credits. Just know, the property tax is more economically neutral than the sales tax. Then you have, efficiency is actually a good word. Your tax system should be easily complied with and easily administered. Fortunately, Alabama's taxes aren't particularly difficult to administer. Uh, and the last principle is accountability. Uh, citizens should know 
know uh, very clearly what their tax liabilities are. How much did you pay in sales tax last year? <laughs> I, how would I know? So I haven't the slightest idea, but thousands and thousands of dollars. I live in Montgomery County. Sales tax? <laughs> oh, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, you'd have to accumulate everything you bought in the past year. You think that's sort of an accountability problem that no one has any idea what their sales tax is? Yeah, that uh, that makes it hard. It, it's it's. Be and that's why a lot of people prefer the sales taxes because it appears to be pennies at a, pennies at a time. All right, but you could say how much you paid in income or property taxes. Could oh, yeah. Uh, two years ago when I looked at the numbers, um, uh, 115 of the 130 Alabama school systems had local sales tax revenue as part of their revenue stream. Of those, 50 of them got more money from local sales taxes than from local property taxes, which meant a majority of their money was coming from the sales tax. And yes, a case can be made that we ought to move away from sales tax so much and move more toward ad valorem tax. The property tax is supposed to tie taxes to benefits. So, local government public goods like roads, fire protection, and parks are typically paid for with property taxes because they create property's values. It's an investor type tax. You know that you're investing in public services and you know that the return you get from that would be greater property value if the services are good, if the schools are good and all of that. With sales taxes funding everything, you don't have any of that. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it's, it runs against responsibility for your own local services. So property taxes are superior to sales taxes at funding local government because local government services directly impact property values but they don't as directly impact the amount of local sales. For example, you can probably imagine this situation. Man, I really want to buy a house in this neighborhood. Me too, because the streets are so safe and well paved. Plus, the fire department's tops and the schools are the best in the state. You don't have to tell me twice. I'm really willing to pay a lot for property in this neighborhood. But can you picture this? You shop here too? Of course I do. The local school has great computer facilities. And I hear the local library just got remodeled. <laughs> you don't have to tell me twice. I'm willing to pay a lot for chips in this neighborhood. According to Amendment 373, Alabama uses a classified property tax system where different types of property are taxed at different rates. Homes, farms, and timberland pay property taxes on 10% of value. Commercial property, 20%. Also, farmland and timberland aren't taxed at market value, which is what they would sell for. Rather, they're taxed on the current use value, which is the land's value at what its owners are using it for. This is controversial because timber companies owning large swaths of land often pay only a few dollars per acre in taxes. When we're only paying, receiving at the state general fund about a dollar a year on certain kinds of land, primarily mm -hmm. forest land, uh, where that same acre just across the line in Georgia or in Mississippi or Tennessee or Florida will be up taxed at double, triple, five or ten times that rate. It seems kind of simple to me that we ought to have a better system. What you end up doing is you take all that property off the tax rolls in order to raise the same amount of money that you need, everybody else has to pay a little bit more. Mm. or a lot more in some cases. What caused that property to go up in value? The development of that community, the infrastructure, the water, the sewer, the roads, that made that property value go up. Well, that citizen or that company that owns that parcel of land is benefiting from that and all the rest of us paid for the infrastructure. So I think that we need a fairer tax structure where those that benefit uh, pay their freight because mm. they don't in Alabama right now, in my opinion. You and I pay a disproportionate amount of freight for those that benefit from the natural resources and the great opportunities in our state. The classified property system, tax system creates uh, inequities because different types of property are taxed at different levels. Let me give you an example of that. Homewood is one of the wealthier school districts in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, Lowndes County is one of the poorest school districts in the state. Um, in Homewood, two-thirds 
or so of the property value is in commercial property. We tax commercial property at 20% of its value. In Lowndes County, about two-thirds of the property is in agricultural or timber uses. And we tax that at 10% and then on the current use uh, value. Therefore, by definition, the Lowndes County school system has a very difficult uh, problem of obtaining local tax revenue to support schools. Mm. Throughout the nation, anywhere you've seen centralization of school public finance where the state takes over greater shares of school funding, you've seen a decline in test scores, in school uh, achievement, and student achievement uh, across the board. You know why? Because then the, the, because the parents are no longer in control. If you make decisions locally, people can decide for themselves what they want, and if they have to pay for it, that's the right way to do business. Mm -hmm. Because that makes it be more efficient, because you, you have a personal stake in it. The number one indicator of property values in this country is the quality of schools. If people think that all their schools are going to be funded out of Montgomery, they don't have much reason to be interested in how they're run and whether they're effective at educating students. And so local ownership is just a fundamental thing. Earmarking is a, a designation of where tax revenues are going to go before the fact. Mm -hmm. So if we raise a tax, we say, well, it's, this is only going to be used for this purpose. And so Alabama has the highest level of earmarking of any state. Our Constitution restricts revenue sources from certain taxes um, and designates within a constitutional provision how certain tax revenue can be used by our government. It's not necessarily a bad thing. What we tend to do though is we put those earmarks on there forever. What that means is that when the legislature goes to budget monies, uh, everything is nailed down to one place or another and the services that don't have earmarked sources of money are pretty much out of luck because all the money that's of any consequence is already earmarked in advance. Uh, some tax funds grow uh, beyond the needs of what it was that tax was originally uh, designed for. Some tax revenues decline. So therefore, there is very little financial control over the budget because everything's already been decided in advance. But of course, you can't predict everything that's going to happen in advance. It's wise to earmark a good share of your revenues. So every state does, to some extent. But Alabama earmarks conspicuously more than anyone else. Nevada, in second place, isn't even close, and we're four times the national average. So what accounts for our peculiarity? That Alabama is a pioneer of government innovation? Or that something's wrong? reform. Yes. I would probably venture to guess that if anybody probably has their hands on some type of publication that's just that, even if it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not the entire thing, you know, from 18, whatever, but, you know, I bet you they probably have or can tell you, let me see if they have anything on their site here where it says, Secretary of State Office, how can I help you? Hello, uh, my name is Lewis Lee, and I, I'd like to get a copy of the Georgia State Constitution. Okay, I can mail you a copy. You can email me a copy? Uh, I don't have it in an email version. No, no, oh, no. did you say mail me a copy? I'll mail you a copy. Okay, yes, um, I'd, like, I'd like to receive one. Um, would I have to pay for it? or? No. Okay. I'd, I'd like to get a copy of the Tennessee State Constitution. Okay, um, let me tell you how you... Real quick. Well, actually, is there a way that I could get it by mail? Maybe, like, get a copy for use in my home? Sure, I, I, I don't see why not. Let me get your name and mailing address. Okay.
For example, here's a graph of the market for my favorite food. Supply and demand meet up at the equilibrium price, where customers pay a dollar per tomato for 100 fried green tomatoes. Through the buying and selling of fried green tomatoes, customers are better off by the amount shown in yellow, aka the consumer surplus, while the restaurants are better off by the amount shown in blue, aka the producer surplus. This is the market's optimal arrangement, and it happens naturally without government interference. Now, the government piles on a nine cent sales tax. Because of the tax, the supply curve shifts upward by nine cents and the price increases along the demand curve to say a dollar or five, depending on how much of the tax is borne by the customers and how much is borne by restaurants. Since less people demand fried green tomatoes at the new price, the quantity sold drops. Restaurants do less business and customers buy less tomatoes. The government raises the amount of money shown in the box, but society as a whole is worse off by the amount in the triangle. This triangle is called a dead weight loss, and it's what happens when government policies distort the market. Let's compare this to a property tax. To an economist, a property tax is actually two taxes. The first is a tax on buildings and other property improvements. Because building and improving land are activities just like frying tomatoes, the first tax damages the market. Less buildings go up. The second tax, though, is a tax on unimproved land, which is the land's value if nothing was on it, and it's a different story. Take a look at the land market. What's important about the land market is that the supply curve is vertical, because land isn't typically created or destroyed. Therefore, economists give land a rent, and all land has rent. If you live on your own land, you're renting the land from yourself. Now, the government enacts a tax equal to 20% of the land's rental value. The government collects the tax shown in the box, but since the supply of land stays the same, rent doesn't change, and there's no dead weight loss. So, society is just as well off as it was before the tax. Now, half the property tax hurts our overall prosperity, and half doesn't. Overall, though, the property tax is much less damaging economically than the sales tax is.